uh, yeah, we're just just admiring the view down to the to the uh, the new Bayport in Haifa, where I visited yesterday uh, and met with the Chinese management. And so, uh, this been, it's been a very interesting trip for me. Uh, I usually do my research travel in China, but now. <coughs> As you may know, you, you need to quarantine for, for three weeks to get there, and as a someone who works for the U.S. Navy, we're, we're less, uh, met with less friendly welcomes than, than we used to be, so it's it's, uh, it's been a real pleasure to be here in Israel, and I'm very grateful to Admiral Horeb and his team, uh, Udi Gonan and everyone else, for helping, helping me uh, have a productive trip. Um, just by way of quick background and introduction so you understand where I'm coming from, I teach at the Naval War College with the China Maritime Studies Institute there, so I actually have, have a very light teaching load. I teach classes on Chinese foreign policy and on Taiwan uh, cross-strait relations, but mostly I do research on Chinese maritime issues. Uh, my, my first book is coming out next year. It's all about Chinese maritime disputes, but my research lately has been all about Chinese port uh, development, commercial port development, as well as some of the Security and military implications of that. So I'm going to I'm going to talk to you about that research today. Um, and there is uh, there are some pretty pictures and some maps here. There's also some Chinese text for those of you who who play Zhongwen. So Hanadong uh, uh, But I uh, I also would like to encourage you if at any point you have a a question or are not clear about anything, I'm happy to kind of have a have a little bit more of a, of a discussion than just a uh, than just a one-way uh, brief. So, uh, yeah, I will. Uh, I'll start by saying. Let me take out my notes. Excuse me. Yes. Just very little question from the beginning. Sure. Your last name. But is it Cardoon or is it Hardoon, which was related to the Iraqi uh, in the Good question. No, it's, it is it is not the uh, the Kaduri cartoons. Uh, okay, that's no, we, we we would have been uh, Kardonsky. Uh, okay, my that's my, fa my family are, are Ashkenazi Jews okay. from, from uh, <laughs> Eastern Europe. That's fine. But uh, good good question. Uh, <laughs> good point. Yes. Uh, but uh, at any rate, yeah, my my Chinese name is Kong Shurhai, too, which is also no relation to the Kaduris. Um, but at any rate, at any rate so <clears throat> the, uh, the research that I've been doing uh, alongside finishing up the, the book manuscript for some time now started with the simple observation that I'm sure many of you have been aware of that Chinese firms went from not being very present in global uh, shipping and port and sort of maritime transport and logistics uh, sectors to being a, a quite a prominent player and even a dominant player in certain parts of that market. So we started out looking at a few of the ports in the Indian Ocean. I'll talk a little bit about why we think those are, are sort of the, the central issues for Chinese uh, economic as well as military planners in the Indian Ocean, but I've subsequently started thinking more broadly uh, and, and I've done a fair amount of research into finding all of the ports that Chinese firms own or operate around the world. Uh, so that doesn't include all the ports that Chinese firms have built or done some construction on, like Ashdod, for example, where, where I'll visit tomorrow. I'm interested in it, but this research is really focused on what is the what is the use of these assets when a Chinese firm owns and operates, uh, operates a terminal. Um, and I guess just to to give you the, the bottom line up front, as they say in the US, and so if you, if you tune out now, you'll, you'll remember something about it, is that the, the thing that I view as most significant about China's uh, position in global ports is the network effect of having a lot of different ports around important regions of the world that have a major commercial uh, as well as a security impact by virtue of their, their scale and by virtue of the connections between them. And I'll talk a little bit about how that works. But ultimately, if you come away with some, one thing here, it's that, you know, related, say, to the Haifa port down the hill. The Haifa port individually, I think uh, we can talk plenty about the, the, the individual features of it and any particular risks or concerns associated with it. But ultimately, those are sort of a secondary issue. What's of most relevance from a strategic standpoint, from the standpoint of international politics, in my view, is 
the scale and the distribution uh, and the concentration of Chinese firms in this vital sector. Uh, here we're talking about ports, but we can think just generally about maritime, maritime transport and trade. So uh, that's more, more or less the bottom line. Let me uh, assume everyone can hear me okay. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna use the mic here. Let's see. Yes, please. Yes, that's right. So, so I, I, yeah, I should add also. So I'm here continuing research on ports, but I'm generally interested in Chinese investment in Israel. I've been talking to plenty of people. I was down in Jerusalem uh, speaking with people from the foreign ministries, speaking with people in the transportation ministry, and uh, yeah, China-Israel relations is something that I'm. I'm starting to learn about. I'm a China specialist, not an Israel specialist. I've, I've got a lot to learn about some of the domestic issues here, but yes, I'm, I'm familiar with, with a couple of the other areas of investment. Uh, I've talked to numbers of people about technology generally as well, in, in addition to infrastructure. But uh, for the purposes of, of the, of the uh, let's see, I'm sort of falling off the side here. I wonder if we could, is there any way to turn this? Sort of. Uh, you can't quite see the left side here, but at any rate, it says it might be it might be my mistake on my slides. So anyway, that's Xi Jinping, as you can recognize uh, in, in both pictures here. He's here. This is a this is the port of Piraeus, not not far from here, uh, and I think it's important to sort of understand before we start talking about some of the the consequences, say of uh, China having this position in, in global maritime transport to understand where this came from, why all of a sudden we see lots of Chinese firms that are uh, you know, out, out there in, in the Eastern Mediterranean, in Latin America, in, in North Europe, you name it. Um, and I would point to this maritime power program, Hayam uh, Changguo, for those of you who are, who are uh, Mandarin linguists. And this is something that, that has been circulating around Chinese strategic circles for a long time. And it's, it, in a way, it's a reaction to China's long-standing emphasis on its continental position. Uh, particularly nowadays, now that the, the maritime power program is, is, uh, is well known, it's sort of a standard historical story that Chinese tell themselves that you know, the reasons for China's humiliation in the, in the 19th century into the 20th century have to do with maritime weakness in a way, that they were invaded by Europeans, invaded by Japanese, and this was always the weakness of their maritime approaches. And so whether that's true or not, it's now sort of uh, an article of faith, and it's part of the, the, the story about why China is now uh, becoming a maritime power. And here, these two quotes from Xi Jinping from two... Uh, two different speeches that he's given in the last couple of years, I think, give you a sense of some of the ways that that, uh, that maritime power goal is expressed. The first one, I think, is the obvious one, and I think it's the one that uh, the, the, the managers and officials in charge of the Haifa port here will be familiar with. Uh, and it's that a port is a, is a great way, in some settings at least, is, is a great way to develop a, a local economy, it's a great way to develop a hinterland, uh, and from the Chinese perspective, uh, it's been a really, really successful way for them to grow their economy very quickly. Uh, starting, especially in the night, late 1970s, China's economy was heavily oriented around export trade, uh, you know, domestic manufacturing and exporting, uh, exporting goods, and it's still, it is still a big part of China's economy, and transport infrastructure, especially ports that service large container ships, that's been sort of the, the, the linchpin of a lot of this economic development. And you see all over coastal China, you know, seven of the 10 largest container parts, ports in the world by fruit litter in China, eight of the 10 by cargo volumes. It's an incredible concentration of maritime trade and transport. Um, but. As you can see in this other quote, you, probably, you may not be able to read it as well. So I'll, this is from a, a speech that Xi Jinping gave to a party work conference uh, in, in 2020, talking about, among other things, the effects of the COVID pandemic on supply chains. But part of China's interest in developing ports, not just in China, but globally, has to do with a feeling of 
insecurity or vulnerability to, among other things, U.S. naval power, to U.S. allies, to disruptions like COVID, to disruptions like uh, the, the ever given trapped in the Suez Canal, any number of external factors. And there's this sense, as, as Xi Jinping is saying here, that China wants to tighten the dependence of the international industrial supply chain on China and form a strong countermeasure and a deterrent capability for outsiders to artificially cut off supply. This idea that China both needs to insulate itself from risks to its own maritime supply, and I'll get into what those supplies are and why they're so vital, but also be able to, to credibly show that they can interfere or cut off or deter uh, others who might seek to disrupt China's vital flows of resources, uh, especially commodity inputs like oil and gas and minerals, but also access to markets uh, like those in Europe and in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, so, you know, even though you're probably familiar with, um, you know, a lot of the branding around Chinese maritime projects, everybody knows about the Belt and Road now or the Mar Maritime Silk Road. Um, I don't talk that much about that. I, I still personally, I'm not even sure what the Belt and Road is. I've read almost everything that the Chinese authors have written about it. I've been to conferences about it. I've read all the English language reports on it. It's still not entirely clear to me. It's very, it's very fuzzy. According to a Chinese researcher, Israel's part of the Belt and Road. He just wrote a whole book, Israel and the Belt and Road. The Shanghai International Port Group talks about the Haifa port as being a, 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 a jewel in the Belt and Road. If Israel is, and I believe I'm correct in saying Israel hasn't, as a formal or official matter, uh, agreed to sign up for it. It's just sort of something that people say to talk about Chinese economic uh, activity, and you know, particularly with infrastructure, it's a way to it's a way to lend some coherence to it. But I don't think it really means much, and it actually comes from a much longer line of economic policies and I think ultimately strategic choices that China's made at least since 2000 when they started, when they joined the World Trade Organization that following year, started talking about this maritime power program. It started with encouraging Chinese firms to go out to, uh, you know, to acquire, among other things, acquire equity in mineral resources and hydrogen oil and gas, uh, to start investing directly in foreign economies. And then, yeah, starting, starting now eight, nine years ago, they rebranded it as the Belt and Road, and there was a lot of infrastructure involved in it. But ultimately, this has to do with China's basic economic model, which requires very intensive uh, resource inputs and requires access and cheap transport for exported goods. So, let me see if I click. There we go. Um, so don't worry if you can't read this, but I'm just giving you sort of a sense of some of the, some of the ways that we try and think about where the motivation for Chinese firms, in particular, comes from as they go out into into international markets. And this is this is a little excerpt from the China Ports Yearbook. So it's a it's a meeting of a lot of leaders from China's port industry, as well as from the government. So uh, people from the Ministry of Transportation. Uh, and the chair people from the China Ports and Harbors Association, the heads of the Dalian Port, the Qingdao Port, Ningguo Port, Tianjin, all these major hubs. And what they think about is, as they try and internationalize, as they try and forge, say, alliances with foreign ports, which was the case between Shanghai and Haifa before a Shanghai firm came here to build it, is that they are one of the many entities in China that are expressing this, this essentially central goal of building maritime power, of having Chinese ownership and operations and ultimately some level of control, some level of, of uh, you know, control over their fate in the maritime domain, I think is a way to think about it. And they want to enhance China's voice in international ports. And they also want, as writing here, that they want um, to, to encourage internal efforts to strengthen the business networks and the cooperation and the information sharing among Chinese ports and Chinese maritime industries. And I think this is something that, that's hard for us to grasp in the United States and maybe perhaps less so in Israel with, with a, a 
a slightly different state structure and more state ownership, but ultimately there's a very corporate kind of setting in which all of this Chinese port development takes place. The Shanghai International Port Group, who's here down the hill in Haifa, is, uh, is used to be part of the Shanghai, used to be essentially the Shanghai uh, Transportation Ministry. It's now been commercialized as a firm. It has all this overlapping ownership structure involving a bunch of the Chinese port firms. And all of them essentially are organized around this, this central corporate interest in internationalizing Chinese presence in global ports to, to be a conduit for a, a more uh, essentially Chinese-centric trading network. Um, and so I'm happy to talk about more of the, the sources and, and, and ways that we get at this. And you'll, you'll see some of these uh, in these slides here, but just for a sense of it. Okay. So as I said, one of the things that we've done in this research is to find, by, by hook or by crook, in a very, very slow uh, process, all of the ports around the world in which a Chinese firm has either an equity stake in a lease or a concession or uh, an operating lease. And usually those go together, but there's at least one big case where there's just equity and no operation. So it's worth it's worth separating them, but for the most part, what we're talking about here is not the things that people usually think about when they uh, talk about the Belt and Road, whatever that is, which is to say building under a contract to do engineering and to you know dredge a harbor or to, to, to build a pier or whatever, whatever the particular contract is for. But here we're talking about leases, often long-term, 25 years in Haifa is actually somewhat shorter than, than a lot of the leases that we see. Some of them are as long as 99 years. And I guess the, the thing that, that I want to call to your attention here is we've, we've color-coded them. It's probably a little hard to see. But to, to cover the main players in the Chinese sector, and it's important that there are only three firms that really do this at any great scale. It's Costco, Hutchison, and China Merchants Port. Costco and China Merchants Port are central state-owned enterprises. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Chinese um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, state enterprise system, the central ones, and there are only about 97 of them now, are ones that are directly administered by a central state organ. Their chief leadership, their, their CEO, as well as certainly their party secretary, are directly appointed by the party. They have a government rank. They're vice ministers in the government, and so it's it's a it's a particular type of entity. It's not so unfamiliar, perhaps, to, to some other uh, state-owned enterprises, except for that party element, which I think is is a really important kind of integrator. Uh, and they account for over 80 percent of all the Chinese projects uh, that we see. And if we consider their equity cross holdings in some of the Chinese local, oh, thank you, local enterprises, uh, as well as private firms, is well over 90%. It's basically just these three firms, especially Costco and China Merchants, which are, are state-owned enterprises that are deeply involved in the whole network. For example, Shanghai International Port Group has 15% stake for Costco and about, uh, I think it's 20, 27, uh, you know what, I think it's in the 30s for China Merchants Port, for two, two or three separate entities. So they're big shareholders in this, they're very involved in the whole enterprise. And I think this is really important when we think about these network effects. Can you can you have within your corporate network, uh, you know, all the assets that you need to move goods around the world, whether for commerce, for military purposes, or potentially to disrupt uh, those supply chains for others. This chart here is actually, I put it up there, especially because it's it. There's there's so little um, so little that you can take away from it in a way. It shows you that there's a, a very wide distribution of ports across the globe. Basically, every continent, or in fact, every continent except for Antarctica has a Chinese port, uh, or Chinese owned or operated port. Uh, and they're fairly evenly distributed. There's, a, there's naturally more of a concentration in East Asia, uh, but ultimately quite a big presence in Africa, uh, a growing presence in the Western Hemisphere, a big presence in Europe. Um, and 
if you just think about it in terms of continents, you're not going to really see in. But when you think about maritime, the sort of the geography of maritime trade and transport, uh, and you also read what the Chinese are saying about this space, you can think about the distribution and the concentration of ports in a different way. And this is just my crude introduction of this, uh, this uh, uh, sea line of communication uh, that a lot of Chinese, both strategists as well as industry people, think of as China's maritime lifeline. And the reason they talk about it as a lifeline is that, uh, as I'm sure you all know, China's, since 1993, has been a uh, net importer of oil. Its economic development is heavily predicated on increasing volumes of hydrocarbons. 40 to 50% of that comes from this little gulf right here. A big proportion of it comes from Africa as well. Uh, and about 80% of their imported oil flows through the, the Straits of Malacca here and up to the markets of eastern China, where basically all the population and, and economic activities cluster. And so they think of this as a lifeline in a very fundamental way. The, the engine turns off and the, the wheels stop turning without stable, growing, secure supplies of energy, supplies of mineral inputs, especially from Africa. Uh, and equally importantly, and the reason that these arrows go both ways, is access to these export markets. Europe is China's biggest export market, the EU, even bigger than the United States, even uh, before, before their trade war started a few years ago, uh, continues to be a, a focus of Chinese economic attention. Uh, and the developing world, particularly the populous parts of Africa, big underdeveloped but very populous countries like Ethiopia, all over South Asia um, as well, these are, these are potential huge growth arenas for, for China and essentially as China seeks to move up the global value chain, they talk about uh, industrial transfer as part of the strategy. They don't want to be locked in to this export-led economy where all they do is ship out cheap products. They want to move that industry to Bangladesh, to Ethiopia, to uh, Pakistan, you name it. They want that all out there. They want Chinese firms to own and operate it but they want higher value uh, in China. And so all of this is a short way of saying is that China's economic present as well as China's economic future relies very much on this area. And, and like I said, when we first started out studying ports, we were most interested in the Indian Ocean. We were looking at ports in Myanmar, ports in Sri Lanka, where you see is obviously a very sort of central part of this sea lane, uh, Pakistan, and of course, Djibouti, where we see the very first uh, Chinese military base overseas. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about that one at length, but I think it's really notable that five years before it became a military base, it was a China merchant's port, multi-purpose port. Uh, and you know, whether or not China merchants you know, w w was in on this project or not is kind of irrelevant. It is essentially the idea that, uh, as I'll talk about, that a port is, creates the, uh, the circumstances and the environment in which Chinese interests start to blossom and multiply. And when you have economic interests, you end up with security interests. And this is sort of a process that we're seeing, especially across this region. I don't think it's uh, quite as, as pronounced in the Western Hemisphere yet but uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the areas where we see this kind of interesting connection between commercial and strategic purposes. Um, and I guess on that point, it's just something to remember uh, that, that may be easy to wrap your head around. People often ask me or my colleagues, they say, well, are Chinese ports or other infrastructure, are they being developed for strategic purposes or for just benign commercial purposes? And the answer is yes. That, well, yeah, so dual use is one way to think about it, but I think it's even more its even more integrated than that. Yes, commercial, any commercial port has some level of utility for a naval vessel, but I think, I think of strategy even more broadly than just you know, military operations, and it's that commerce is the strategy. 
I suppose is the way to think about it. It's really, really necessary for China both to have access to resources and markets and also to secure that access and those markets. And so just having this economic model essentially creates the necessary demand for, uh, for, for military protection of some kind. Uh, and a really important way to kind of think about this, this historically is that prior to the last few years, it was unthinkable that China would have either the military or the political capacity to provide security. They really relied very much on an essentially peaceful and open system. The US Navy likes to think that's part of the, the public, global public good that the, that the Navy provides. I don't know if you can measure that or not, but I think the Chinese believe that in some fundamental way. They think that markets and resources have been open and available to them essentially because of a, some type of global order provided by the US and its allies, but they worry that that won't necessarily last forever. And as relations get more, more strained, uh, they are very interested in developing uh, their own at least hedged uh, alternative to it. And it's, it's certainly not clear, as I'll get into, that it is a, it's a, uh, it's a substitute for it, but it is certainly a, a sort of an insurance policy against it, and I think it has its own momentum that we'll talk about in a bit. Um, so just worth noting, looking at the data, this has been a real concentration uh, of these projects. There are 94 altogether, as I said. Uh, almost half of them are within, you know, essentially uh, within a day's sail of this lifeline. So they're part of, part of this basic east-west trade across the Indian Ocean and up into the Med. Uh, and especially since 2015, uh, two-thirds of the new Chinese projects have been along this line. So Hi-Fi included among them, it's up on the, you know, on the very end of it. Sir. You talk about the struggle with America, but what about Russia? Is there any collision with the, between the Chinese and the Russian interest in the sea? Like, for example, in the Mediterranean, Russia have a big airport they, in a Syria. That's right. And no. I'm not talking about the Black Sea, in, only right. the route to the Black Sea. So, and, and the north uh, eastern of the Far East. Sure. That's a good question. And yeah, this, this map unfortunately cuts off the Arctic and there's a... No, I'm talking about the... Yeah, and I understand you're talking about the Black Sea and the Eastern Men. No, yeah, like the Sakhalin in the north of the... Yeah, Up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The so, yes, yeah, so for anybody who studies the, the shipping industry, and I imagine there, there are many here who know this better than I, I should say I'm, I'm a humble Chinese foreign policy scholar who's learning learning about maritime trade and transport, but you know Russia. Um, Russia has not been a partner for China in Chinese development of ports and shipping for the most part. Uh, China has been interested in investing in a number of ports in the Arctic that haven't come to fruition. Um, uh, Arkhangelsk, that's right, was the, is the one. I think it's still under discussion, but they haven't. They haven't finalized any of it, and I wouldn't be surprised if that never materializes. Doing this research, as I said, it's a very, we had we, we hired some people to help, but ultimately I had to spend a lot of time combing through every single report. They tend, Chinese media tend to report things as though they're already completed and there's some number of billion dollars associated with it. But often, as an Arkhangelsk in, up in the Arctic Circle, it's just a, it's just an idea in some, some, uh, some business promoters head and they want people to know about it. But, you know, China and Russia have, uh, I think this is, this is a very long conversation if we want to get into it, we can, but they obviously have quite, they have quite a, uh, a distinctive relationship. They have had such a distinctive relationship from the very long histories of, of the, empires that preceded the current states. China, of course, is, uh, thinks of itself as a Marxist-Leninist system. They owe a great debt or a great grudge against their, their, uh, their friends from the Soviet Union. And they now, in an era, particularly in the era of US unipolarity, which they both believe is, is now over and, and is part of a new multipolar era, think of themselves as natural partners in some way. But I don't think that that partnership extends into, uh, you know, their, their discrete interests in regions that are distant from from both of them. I think Russia, uh, 
Russia's interested in projecting military power in in its you know in its own kind of acute way and complicating, for example, American efforts in Syria and pursuing its own narrower economic and political interests. China, for the most part, wants to steer clear of these types of conflicts. They're happy to have Russia cause some some friction, but they really I think the United States, uh, despite often lumping them together as their great power competitors uh, is in the process now of trying to disaggregate them again. I certainly, as a member of the, of, uh, of the China studies community, think of them as fundamentally different problems. I think there is scope for them to, to cooperate in some areas, but I think ultimately, um, you know, they're, they're seeking different things in, in this region. Russia's, a, Russia's an oil exporter, China's an oil importer. They look, they look at the region as a, as a different sort of geopolitical problem. The only shared thing is they'd like to see America suffer. They would like to see, uh, they would like to see things more complicated uh, for the U.S. being able to get its way. And that, that takes, you, takes you somewhere, but I think it doesn't take you into the level of, of, of real cooperation, maybe some level of coordination the highest uh, I can imagine. But ha happy to come back to that. Let me, uh, <laughs> let me make sure that we're doing okay on time. 11.10. Okay, so let's think about, you know, we talked to, we've talked a bit about the, the economic uh, drivers for this and the connections between those economic issues and sort of the, the strategic picture that China faces as a nation that's very dependent on imported commodity inputs, uh, oil, gas, minerals especially. Uh, I guess you could throw into that mix semiconductors, any, any number of other parts of the global supply chain. They're very deeply integrated into it. Um, but what, what are the implications of China having such a big, an outsized role, as we saw with that wide distribution of Chinese ports uh, around the world, such an outsized role in the overall maritime transport system. And I think it's worth noting that those big firms, Costco, China Merchant Sport, especially Costco, they are also very, very big market players across the whole maritime logistics and transport sector. Merchant shipping, containers, uh, it's, uh, maritime insurance, you name it. Every single piece of the of the puzzle, shipbuilding, of course, uh, every single piece of the puzzle, they, they are their subsidiaries or their close partners within this essentially corporate uh, Chinese system are, are deeply invested. So we talked a little bit about in the very beginning when we looked at what Xi Jinping was telling his economic work conference that there is this intention to, to both control supply chains and then potentially to use that control as a source of leverage. I think the Australians have had a very acute experience of this lately. For those of you watching it, you know, there it had a lot more to do with trade dependence, per se, than, than direct control of the maritime uh, transport levers. But ultimately, they're, they're very intimately connected. Chinese firms own and operate the port of Newcastle in Australia. This is the main hub for coal exports to China. And so when Beijing decides they no longer want to import coal from Australia because they're angry at them for wanting to investigate COVID, they're able to very easily disrupt that uh, at, at every level. And it's a type of coercive capability. It's a type of, some people will call it economic statecraft. But it's something that's not, it's not really speculative it's not hypothetical, it's something that we now see as a part of China's uh, diplomatic repertoire. And I think unfortunately for Israel, just bringing it closer to home, the story with Australia is very much, um, uh, those of you who know, know Chinese, it would be, uh, uh, what is it? Sha Ji Sha Ho, to kill the chicken, to scare the monkey. This idea that they're, they're not going to beat up directly on the United States in most ways, but what they'll do is kill one of our, you know, kill our, kill our smaller friend, Australia, with a very coercive measure in order to put us on notice and to show the United States that we're not able to protect, show our allies that we're not able to protect them and to demonstrate that 
that the U.S. hegemony in Asia or that the U.S. Uh, sort of system of alliances is, is not as robust as it looks. And I think Israel, unfortunately, is in a similar position where sometimes China may feel that it can punish Israel in order to, uh, to, to affect the United States. Um, and I think we'll, we'll, I'll leave that out there and we can return to it in a bit. But ultimately, this is one of the implications of having a really big position in maritime markets is that there are more coercive levers available to China and they're not just available, they seem to be in use. The Philippines and Japan have had similar experiences. Uh, arguably some European countries are starting to experience this. Um, so I think it's worth, um, it's worth pausing and thinking and, I, and I'm, I'm trying to learn more and, and think more creatively about what are the various ways that having this position in ports and shipping and maritime industries general, generally gives China that type of advantage. Um, another very direct security implication and, and one that uh, we've studied pretty closely is that navies uh, rely on commercial logistics and commercial ports quite extensively. Global navies, even like the United States with a huge network of, of bases all over the world, relies almost entirely on commercial supply of you know basic inputs, fuel and food and water and power and all this. We do have bases for specialized, dedicated purposes, uh, and those are those are essential to the to the more sophisticated operations that the Navy wants to undertake. But ultimately, as a matter of sustaining global force posture and presence, it is a it is a commercial logistics network. And the U.S. now, uh, more so than ever arguably, relies on essentially the goodwill and good faith of lots of commercial suppliers in lots of different countries. Relationships that in some cases are very long-standing and are very robust, in other cases are very ad hoc. We, re we read a lot of what people from the PLA, particularly from their, their logistics community, they have a whole transportation academy, um, in, uh, in Dalian, particularly their research on it, and they understand that China is not in a position now, nor will it be in five years, 10 years, 20 years, to have a big network of global bases, naval bases, unless and until there's some major global war uh, or some other major, major political disruption there aren't really the political conditions under which something like that could happen. Uh, and I don't think that that's what they expect or intend. And what they've had to do is make do with the fact that they now have a much wider set of what they call overseas interests, and I'll talk a little bit about how they think about that, overseas interests that they need to protect. And they also have, at the same time, this huge network of commercial facilities that has it has essentially evolved out of China's economic strategy. And what they've said is, we need to take advantage of this, these assets. This is the next best solution for the Navy. The Navy has been saying, the Chinese Navy that is, for years and years, wouldn't it be great to have bases here, here, and there? Uh, they didn't used to be able to say that out loud. Maybe the last 10, 12 years they can write about it, no problem. And that's a natural, for, for anybody here with a, a naval background or even a merchant shipping background, perfectly natural desire, but from the central leadership's perspective, that's very costly. It's very difficult to establish relationships that would support a military base. Often, in, in most cases, that has to do with either an alliance, a treaty alliance, or, uh, or some very extreme security circumstance, uh, or earlier in history, having a colony. China is very averse to some of these implications. They used to, you know, they used to think of themselves as, as big anti-imperialists and anti-colonialists. They still talk about that, and so there was sort of there's sort of a resistance to do it. And additionally, there's an expectation that each time China even slightly militarizes any type of presence, there's a disproportionate reaction from the United States, from U.S. allies. We think about the Indian Ocean, they're very, very attentive to India, specifically, whom they would like to keep non-aligned permanently. And so when there's this perception that China is building a, a string of pearls around them, 
when they give credence to that by by having a you know a submarine pull into Colombo or into Karachi, they feel very they, they feel a disproportionate response. They don't get that much military utility out of it, but they get a very concerned India that gets closer to the U.S. or gets close gets further away from China. So. What the Navy has done, and this is a picture here of, of a, uh, one of the PLA Navy task forces uh, that's been out in the Gulf of Aden since 2008. This is their visit to uh, Abu Dhabi, where I, where I was just in Abu Dhabi uh, two weeks ago before coming here. Uh, this is the, the, the big new container facility that Costco built there. You can see the Costco, Costco crane there. And you can see this big group of Chinese nationals who all work in the Emirates there. And they're actually on their way to go meet, uh, the, they ended up meeting with uh, MBZ's deputy uh, for, uh, for, I guess, economic investment matters, a very senior person as well as the head of the Emirati Navy. They have worked very hard to develop good relations with the Chinese enterprises that own and operate these facilities, and they talk explicitly about wanting to leverage their relationships in those countries, leverage their infrastructure and assets, and leverage essentially the diplomatic and commercial goodwill to create uh, what they're increasingly calling uh, strategic strong points. And this has been the subject of some of the research we've done. It's not a, it has not been defined yet in, in the PLA dictionary, but uh, overseas strategic strong points. Hi, why John, like Jurgen, sometimes they say for those of you uh, or, or linguists. Um, and this is a section from, as you can see, already eight years old. But this is a this is a teaching textbook for the PLA. So a little bit like the Naval War College. This is a this is a school for officers. It's not it's not junior cadets. It's people who've been in the service over ten years who are starting to be trained to think about policy and strategy as opposed to just operations, tactics, etc. And the Navy is very intent on, you know, first of all, talking about some way of sustaining their global presence without talking about building a big network of bases, which they understand to not be something that's possible for them. But they talk about them depending on the homeland, so definitely very much being tied to this Chinese network but moving us into the direction of the two oceans, that's the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. And you'll notice this is 2013, this is before anybody was talking about the Indo-Pacific. The Chinese, for reasons that you can see very easily from a map, think about the Indo-Pacific. That's, that's their maritime periphery, the Indian Ocean on the southern side and the Pacific is on the southern and the eastern side. This is the maritime space that they live in. Um, and they're explicit about it. They say these strategic strong points, and we'll talk about what this may actually mean. It's not entirely clear. But these are sites that provide support for overseas military operations or act as a forward base for deploying military forces overseas and exerting political and military influence in relevant regions. Um, another excerpt from this same textbook a couple of years later is expanding some of the ideas about what you can get out of a strategic strong point. That is not a base, but some sort of uh, Chinese invested, owned and operated facility that is part of an overall Chinese business presence, economic and commercial presence in a country that can provide some peripheral support for a Navy. So they say, they're talking about some of the missions that might be conducted from, again, from a dual use commercial facility. Improving reconnaissance, Punishment, supply, and support guarantees. So, global logistics and intelligence, fairly explicitly, kit and capacity, while at the same time strengthening our communications with the countries in the Pacific and the Indian Oceans, the Indo Pacific. They talk about actively building overseas supply points, strong points, associating them with military cooperation agreements, uh, and in fact, making adequate preparations. Arguably, they're doing here in Abu Dhabi, touring the site, making sure that the airfield and the pier and the power supply and the water, etc., and the yard are understood by the fleet and able to be used. Making adequate preparations to use airports, ports, terminals, and other facilities, 
Specifically, with a focus on leveraging the strength of our overseas personnel and our state-owned enterprises. Uh, so the military is talking about innovating a new defense mobilization mechanism, making use of overseas personnel and firms to provide support for troops during certain periods. And I think, let's see how our time is here. I want to I make sure we have time to talk about this. So I won't, I won't dwell on this too much longer other than to say this is only one sort of side of the, the commercial development of ports. I don't think that it's the case that every single one of the 94 that we researched is, a, is on its way to becoming a base. Far, far from it, and for reasons that I'm happy to discuss, I don't think Haifa is an example of a place where I'd expect to see a lot of PLA activity. But what we do see, and I've highlighted this on the right, is that the vision is that this is a network that's very supportive of overall Chinese interests. Some of those involve the deployment of the military globally. Um, we'll talk about what, uh, in the last slide, we'll talk a little bit about whether or not that's a, a wartime capability. I think probably not. It's a peacetime, potentially coercive capability. But there are a lot of different ways that Chinese interests can be supported, and different ports serve different roles. Uh, one guy who works for the for the PLA, an academic researcher, sort of like someone who'd be sort of my counterpart in, in China, thinks about four different types of facilities that all in concert, as a network connected, can provide for China's essential strategic and economic needs. Uh, so thinking about at the very high end, a base, of course, requiring an agreement with a host country, often an alliance, permanent deployment of military forces, building of specialized, dedicated infrastructure, et cetera. That's sort of rare, but here, and they're taking a page out of the US book, you can have what, what the US has called a place, uh, which is to say uh, some semi-permanent arrangement that is well equipped and organized to support some. Singapore is probably the best example for the US. They built a pier that's specifically designed for uh, US carriers, of course. Uh, it's not a base. It doesn't have. It, it does have some permanent American military personnel, but they're renting facilities there, and it just so happens that there's a pier that can support them. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the piers that Chinese firms have built and operated in the last slide. And then, you know, sort of uh, steadily moving down the list of different different levels of support that you can get for your various interests. There, uh, here, here's the way that. Uh, a different author thought about, and he's, he's taking a page out of a speech that Xi Jinping gave actually when he announced the Belt and Road in 2013. This idea that individual projects are points. Haifa is a point. On its own, doesn't, doesn't mean a ton, but when you start integrating it into a network that's connected to other points, you get a line and it allows you to do some of these missions, far seas replenishment, ship repair, marine monitoring, maritime search and rescue, medical assistance, anti-piracy, very benign, essentially you know, not non-combat tasks, some of them are not even military. And it's not actually clear what the front is supposed to mean, but ultimately I think of it more as a regional, a regional network, not just the connection between two, three, four, or five ports, but sort of an overlapping, mutually reinforcing system. Um, we talk about this all day, but I think the, the one thing that I really want to impress upon you is not to think in terms of individual ports, but to think about the firm, Chinese firms and enterprises, networks of ports and the ways that their connections, very much in line with the way a maritime you know, industry works, the ways that their connections actually facilitate some of Chinese interests. Um, as I said, I don't think that the the 94 ports that Chinese firms now own and operate give them a, a, a major combat capability or a wartime function. A couple of reasons for that. For one, that's not the way that the PLA Navy is postured, even though they do have, uh, I guess if you're counting ships, counting hulls, they now have the world's largest navy. Uh, they don't have the world's most capable navy, not, not quite yet at least. We'll talk to, talk to my friends back home in Washington and, and uh, Groton, Connecticut, where they're building submarines, et cetera. They're, they're, they're trying to come up with ways for the US to maintain a qualitative edge. But ultimately, the PLA is postured to fight in East Asia and to support 
Chinese interests outside of East Asia, which is to say to protect, as Admiral Wu Shengli, who's the former commander of the PLA Navy, the, the top uniformed official, that these overseas strategic strong point construction, which is to say ports and sort of Chinese industrial zones around them and the transport infrastructure associated with them, they've already provided support for escort operations. That's been the main mission for the Navy. It's not to secure the Persian Gulf. It's not to, you know, fight a war to, to you know, it's not, it's not to be able to shoot tomahawks into Syria when they're angry. This is not the type of force that they're developing. It's that they want to be able to credibly deter other states from trying to interdict their access to vital resources. They're not likely to have allies for whom China's providing some security goods. They're trying to provide security for themselves, and they feel like this commercial network is starting to provide the basis for that. Here, this fellow in the uh, the, the unusual uh, camo uniform is the he's the political commissar at China's Navy base in Djibouti, uh, a senior captain Li Chunpeng, and this was a television interview he gave, and um, he is talking about the PLA Navy starting to think about how they can support and sustain a more permanent military presence in the region. He's now permanently deployed there, uh, or part of a permanent PLA mission in Djibouti, and they want to move away from this idea that they can just support their task forces with underway replenishment with supply ships, or with ad hoc calls and ports, and to think about a model, a new model that mainly relies on overseas base or bases. You don't know from the Chinese, there's no pluralization, um, with replenishment at some other foreign port locations and with domestic support. And I think it is really important to think about the really robust domestic commercial maritime logistics network based out of Shanghai, based out of Shenzhen, based out of Dalian, et cetera, that is, that is owned and operated by Chinese firms like Costco and China Merchants, and how much the Navy thinks about their fate as being entwined with them. So I want to make sure we have plenty of time to discuss. I'll, I'll just leave this up here. We've done an analysis of all the individual terminals and thought about some of the ways that just from their physical characteristics they can or can't support certain Navy uh, missions. And I guess it's worth noting that at 32 of the 94 ports that Chinese firms own or operate, there has been a PLA Navy port call. I had a picture of one of them in, in Khalifa in Abu Dhabi. Uh, that's one of one of uh, 32 that they've been to, in most cases multiple times. Uh, and increasingly, starting in 2017, Chinese media have described some of these stops as technical stops, which is to say they did something more than just take on water and fuel and supplies and maybe have some some uh, some shore rest uh, or liberty, they actually did some work on their vessels. And I think this is part of the longer term process of China developing a robust network that can support its overall um, its overall overseas interests, as the PLA calls it. So um, I'll leave this up here. You're welcome, welcome to uh, ask any questions about this or anything else. I think I'd rather hear from you about any questions on this. I hope this has some uh, some some interest and bearing on, on your own research and, and interests. Sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your speech. It's quite uh, uh, sorry. It's quite uh, um, in line with with what I'm doing for the last seven years, looking into the relations of China in the maritime domain, okay. mainly in the South China Sea. And uh, I just want to uh, introduce a very uh, simple uh, formula to try to explain why the intention of China is not to uh, take over the hegemony of, from the US, but uh, just to survive. And you mentioned very nicely. There are 1.4 billion people in China, and they have to eat and they have to survive. Communist Party, one of the last four, which is still uh, in power, uh, its main, uh, its main uh, policy is to stay, in life, to stay in power. The only way to stay in power is to avoid the revolution. If 1.4 billion people will decide to uh, go to a revolution, it's a big issue. So the uh, government or the, the party has to please them. The only way to please them, you know better with Chinese people, if you give them five uh, cups of food or fries with some uh, food, 
uh, and a place to stay and a place to, and, and a, a, a job they will survive and they will follow you they will not do anything so the party has to maintain a quiet with the citizens the only way to do it is to provide food and there is no, no not enough food in china they have to import a lot of uh, raw material and the other thing is of course to provide to provide the raw material for the industry uh, not only energy but also some other goods and then they have to export it in order to export from china you cannot use but sea lines so uh, the party is so called scared that someone will try to block because of any conflict the sea lines mainly the malacca problem or some other uh, other states this is why they need a strong navy they don't intend to do anything but to support the economy this is my humble uh, humble point and i'm trying to prove it based on the history and culture and the uh, uh, seven thousand or five thousand years of of, uh, of running strategies and uh, unfortunately from my point of view the u.s is not taking into account the cultural points of chinese thinking and, and operations i would like to hear your point mainly on the subject, if I may jump to another issue, which is, you did mention, the freedom of navigation, so this, which is really, sure. to my humble opinion, I was only a commander in the Navy, not the Admiral, a stupid move. And I, I did not, I was not able to get any correct answer or any convincing answer, why do you need to put a finger into the eye of a nation that has a civilization history, not a, not a country history, and you do any mistake available to make them angry. And you don't take into account the culture, how to negotiate with the Chinese people. Another last, last point, if you, if you uh, can say anything about, is a change of uh, naval strategy in the Chinese Navy. And they moved to the, uh, they used before the three island lines in the Pacific, on the east, and now they move also to another two lines in the in the Indian Ocean, reaching the coast of Africa. If you can say the same about it. Sure. So I guess just on the on the first point, I mean, I would say that uh, cult, culture and history are are naturally extremely important in trying to understand anything. I, I've invested a lot of my my life and time. Uh, uh, to studying language and to living and, and researching in China, et cetera. But I also, as a <coughs> as a as an analytical matter, I want to be hard-headed about it, and I want to know what can be explained without recourse to some sort of uh, difficult to grasp, difficult to define notions, and see if you can explain it using only a small number of concepts. And if that doesn't work, then I think you're right. You want to appeal to is there something fundamentally different about China? But I actually, as a general rule, I want to resist that. And having spent a fair amount of time in China, I appreciate the differences, but I also appreciate the similarities. People are people everywhere. Navies are navies. You know, maritime trade is maritime trade, and there's there are there are ways in which I think it, it helps to, to to dispense with sort of mystifying and orientalizing China, and to just think of think of China as a state, or think of China, think of the Chinese Communist Party as a type of party with particular incentives, et cetera. And so I, I'd like to think that's what we're trying to do. I certainly, I'm frustrated in the United States that there are so many people who, uh, starting yesterday, became China experts and now uh, explain to everybody else exactly what we should do. Um, people don't have a lot of patience for complicated answers and so depending on who I'm talking to uh, you know we talk to talk to Navy uh, admirals all the time and we talk to senior policymakers and you need to tell them a different story than you do a group of, uh, of students and faculty who are thinking actively and openly about this but you know ultimately um, in a way it doesn't matter if China's intentions are defensive or are intended to support their economic development. I think that's probably true. Uh, the unfortunate fact of international politics is that uh, intentions don't really matter that much in, in a lot of cases. And the other 
organization, whether it's a state or a navy or, or an ethnic group or whatever it is, feels some consequences and feels some implications from your behavior. So even if, as we were talking about before, that, oops, sorry, let's see if I can go back here. You know, I think I think Xi Jinping re reasonably speaks for Chinese intentions now. And on the one hand, he's saying what you're saying, which is that you want to get rich, you have to build the port in order to support our economic development. We need not just to you know sit, rest back, and and hope that this continues to work. We need to actively develop and grow and build our capacity. But at the same time, they feel vulnerable for understandable reasons. Uh, to things changing and then not being able to, to especially to provide maritime trade uh, that keeps you know keeps the Chinese people uh, fed and keeps the party in power of course being sort of related related essential goals but in order to do that they need to credibly threaten that they can impose some costs on someone else and they need to control as much of it as they can and ultimately this is like some people will call it the tragedy of of great power politics, things that they do to make themselves more secure, make other states less secure, and those states therefore take countermeasures, and you have this, what they call a, a, a spiral model, and it doesn't always play out that way, but I think this is actually a very clear example of, I'm glad that China thinks of itself as having defensive intentions, I think that's better than uh, you know, the Nazis who thought of themselves as having offensive intentions, that makes it worse. But what do you but think? Do they have uh, offensive uh, I, I think intentions? they have, I think they have defensive, uh, they have a defensive doctrine that nonetheless creates power projection capabilities okay. that are offensive. Their defense, this is active defense is their basic doctrinal model, and that means what you do, and you could see this in the nuclear domain too, having a retaliatory capability is essentially it's saying we we don't intend to initiate conflict, but in the event that there's conflict, we, we want to escalate. We want to escalate very quickly in order to gain control of the situation, and ultimately that makes other states less yeah. less secure. And I think that's the dynamic we see. So taking it taking it to the South China Sea, and I I don't want to go too far off our topic here, let's see if I can take us to, yeah, let's, we'll have this map that has the U.S. and China in it too. Um, as I mentioned, my, my, my book is, uh, which comes out next year, it's called China's Law of the Sea, and I'm thinking specifically about how China has dealt historically with international law, particularly law of the sea, and then in the contemporary environment, how they view the law of the sea now in their maritime disputes. And, you know, I guess it's worth, it's worth remembering that American freedom of navigation operations are only one very small thing that the U.S. Navy is doing, even, well, even, out, even out here in the South China Sea. That's just, you know, they, I think last year they had what uh, you counted as ship days, number of days per ship that the U.S. Navy was operating just in the South China Sea. It's about 900, and they did... 10 or 12, I think, freedom of navigation operations. That's one destroyer, sometimes two now. Uh, up to two carriers. Up, uh, well, the carriers aren't doing freedom of navigation operations, but yes, we've had up to two carrier strike groups operating in this space, which, worth noting, it's not a small space. It's, it's one and a half times the size of the Mediterranean. It's a big body of water, and it is an area of, from the U.S. standpoint, it's an area of vital national interest, US, U.S. access to that area from a naval standpoint is sort of, uh, it's from, again, we don't really know what happens if you don't have access there, but the inference is we have had access there continuously since the, the beginning of the 20th century, starting when the U.S. began its, began its essential global uh, development of military power, and the concern is if you don't demonstrate the, the legal principle, which is the narrow operational goal of the freedom of navigation operation, that, that that right ceases to exist. And that if you want access in the, in the case of economic access, you know, whether it's to, you know, 
know, I don't, I don't think commercial shipping is necessarily what's at risk, and I think that's an important side discussion. But it's more that if the United States is excluded from that area, the upshot is the rest of the states in the region will need to defer to China's preferences and whether that is China saying, no, Indonesia, you can't exploit oil and gas down here, or uh, no, the Philippines, you can't host the U.S. military in a base here, whatever, whatever that political arrangement is, from the U.S. strategic standpoint, it relies on not having uh, an exclusive Chinese dominance in the region. I think that's the way that I understand those those uh, operations. I think I think you're right in some fundamental way. They are the publicity around them totally unnecessary. They should be done quietly, and they should be done as as part of the overall package of U.S. Uh, presence in the region. We, that's a much longer discussion about what's the appropriate level. Let, we can talk after. I want to make sure we give other people a chance to speak. Uh, sir, I've got one here and then right behind. Oh, uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, my question here is taking a look historically how, say, the United States itself rose as a commercial power under the British hegemony in the seas, and where eventually it came, became the flag for the dollar. How different is it from what you see now with China? It's the very beginning of something that might yeah. might grow. I mean, it's not nothing here surprises. Yeah, uh, I guess. Sure. But then, I mean, at some point, I understand why the Americans would be very concerned right. uh, with their hegemony in the seas. Okay. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think that's a that's a that's a good historical parallel, and it certainly is. Well, you know, and I think it actually speaks to what you're saying. You know, parallel as opposed to I don't think it's that's what's happening. Is in we need to be conscious of that. And it is worth noting that you know the British didn't think of themselves as having an offensive intent either. They wanted to protect their trade, and they ended up with a global empire. I don't think China's on its way to that specific thing. But the idea that they were incubated, that the Americans were incubated in a way in a system that was dominated by the British Navy, and that the Chinese were incubated or had, you know, had a chance to develop and grow in a system dominated by the US Navy. I think these are important dynamics, and there's some people who like to do very kind of long cycle history, uh, including the Naval War College's famous uh, Alfred Thayer of Mahan. But you know, th there are ways of thinking about this as being a cyclical process of maritime powers competing for uh, you know, glo global access and intention with continental powers. China's an interesting case, though, because unlike Britain and the United States, China is a China is a continental power, and you know I could have given a lecture today. It's not the focus of my research, but about the Eurasian component of this. That's about sort of uh, hedging against some of the. You know, it's, it's actually a, of a piece with this, which is hedging against disruptions in the maritime domain and having having a hinterland in Central Asia, Europe, even uh, South Asia. Uh, that's that's less dependent on maritime. So I think Ch China's different in that way, and I think they think about um, they think about these maritime spaces very much as uh, on, on the periphery of a continental space that's ultimately you know the seat of their security and their power. So um, you raise an interesting point about so at and one that I think provides a very interesting contrast to the British and the US versus the US and the Chinese later, which is that despite having you know, fought wars in the 18th century and the early 19th century, by the 20th century, when the United States fleet was really out there, beginning in the 20th century, uh, and benefiting essentially from the maritime order that the British Navy provided, they had become pretty close allies and pretty well integrated as, a, as an Anglo-American kind of entente. And so while Britain maybe resented American power, I don't think Britain feared American power. Of course they did. Well, they feared it in, in, a different, in a different way than, than the United States, say, fears Chinese maritime power. Our relationship with China is not like our relationship with the United Kingdom, and, you know, and I'm certainly uh, not of the view that you know that requires that, that there's a, a Thucydides trap such that if you have a have an essentially hostile rising power and a declining established power that that both sides are incentivized to conflict. I don't think that's necessarily true. There's some 
there's some crude logic to it, but as a historical matter, it's not obviously the case, and there's a lot of choices and contingencies. So you raise an interesting point about, so at, at what point was it that the United States kind of woke up and said, wait a minute, this is, we've, we've created this system and, and we, we've, uh, we've, we've, we've created a monster in a way, right? We've, we've incubated or, or allowed a, a type of growth in Chinese power, especially maritime power, that's ultimately making us insecure. And I think, um, you know, ironically, I think that sort of happened over the period of the negotiation of and establishment of the Shanghai International Port Group concession in Haifa. Sometime over the period 2012 to 2018, the United States basically came to the conclusion that the, the open economic system in which we're invested doesn't necessarily give us as much benefit as it gives the Chinese and that they're exploiting it and that now we feel some of these acute security pressures. So I think, unfortunately for Israel, you get to experience what that's, what that's like as part of the U.S. network where the United States is, is now, needs to figure out a way to encourage or incentivize or coerce or disincentivize or, or somehow bring its allies and partners around to an idea that um, you don't want to live in a world where you're very vulnerable to Chinese coercion and whether that means there's a sort of separate economic and political sphere, I don't, I don't know. I'd be, I'm interested to know where we're going and if I, if I did know, uh, I, I would uh, probably be placing bets on Wall Street or something like that <laughs> right now. Uh, but yeah, I think ultimately we're at, we're at a real moment of flux, and I think it is an interesting time to study, study, um, you know, how, how different transitions happened in time. And I think, you know, for every transition that did happen, there were hundreds of transitions that didn't. And if you read the history, you'll understand what people were expecting to happen. In the 1970s, the United States thought it was being replaced by the Soviets. In the 1980s, it thought it was being replaced by the Japanese. This happens a lot. China has some more robust fundamentals, I would argue, than, than those other states, but you don't actually know what the pathway is. My colleague Andrew Erickson, uh, whom you know well uh, at Mel Horeb, um, has written a piece recently, I think it was in Foreign Policy, uh, where he thinks that China's sort of reached uh, a peak in its power, arguably now, that there are a lot of structural factors that that suggest that it, that it may not continue to, uh, to gain in relative power. I'm not convinced of that argument, but it's not an unreasonable one, and there's some evidence to support it, and ultimately we just, we just don't know. And I think what we see now, back to this original comment, is a familiar dynamic of insecurity breeding insecurity among great powers, uh, and of it having this very global, global expression in a way that hasn't happened before. There hasn't been this level of economic integration, this level of globalized trade and investment and commerce that attends that transition. And so I think it's one of the reasons that I'm very interested in the port sector, and I'll be studying other aspects of it. I think it's, I think it is, uh, it's sort of the this is the practical side of things. I think you can learn something about the transition. Uh, yeah, I'll go here. Um, back to the discussion about access and. You do, you're obviously familiar with the anti-access area denial, uh, sure. okay. uh, does the U.S. Navy advise that this uh, strategy will be implemented in bases, major bases around the world, like Djibouti, because you don't need like, 94 military bases, you only need right. under 10 in under 10 shock points. That is an interesting question, and I think, I think that from a practical standpoint, yes, it's easy enough to uh, to put some of those, I, I guess, I, I don't like anti-access area denial as much as I just like anti-Navy. I think what the Chinese military development has been, more so than building a big blue water Navy or a big standing army, they've developed an anti-Navy that's very, very potent in the Western Pacific. It's largely Missile capability sensors, etc. But you know, it's, to some degree, the Navy's involved in that. And I actually think, as they wrote in this 
previous uh, slide, Chinese posture and doctrine are much more about radiating into the periphery. There's not any circumstance in which Djibouti, unless and until, yes, there are maybe 10 other support facilities, really becomes a defensible military setting for, you know, for a, for a large-scale operation. They're not, China is not intending to have a fight with the U.S. Navy out near Djibouti. There's no, it, one Chinese strategist described Djibouti as being like Qingdao for the Germans in World War I. For those of you who don't know the story, the Germans in the process of the Russians and the Japanese fighting over control of Chinese territory seized Qingdao and that, that peninsula in China and they wanted to be a big Pacific Navy. It's one of the reasons that they came to blows with the British, not just trying to expand into the Atlantic. But it was their one base in East Asia and immediately when World War I started, the Japanese came in and they, and they knocked it out. Uh, and this Chinese strategist who I think has, has good access to people in China, I think is not, this is not just his, his, his uh, interesting academic idea. I think it's pretty well understood. Djibouti's, Djibouti's good for a couple things. It's good as a, you know, uh, it's good as uh, taking off the band-aid in a way. There didn't used to be any permanent Chinese military presence abroad. Now there is. It's easier to have more after the first one. It provides some limited support for limited operations in, in that region. But ultimately, I think of China's anti-area, excuse me, area denial anti-access capabilities as, as radiating from the homeland. If you want to put, uh, you know, a, a, an anti-ship ballistic missile launcher out in western China, you can start to range into the northern Indian Ocean and even into the Gulf. And I think that's the type of force posture, and particularly given that we don't see any particular strategic reason or any doctrine or any posture that suggests they want to fight in the Gulf or something. It's more that China wants to credibly threaten potential threats to Chinese shipping and Chinese economic access around the world. So I, I would worry less about um, you know, like a Cuban Missile Crisis type thing of China putting some major capabilities out in the Western Hemisphere, although it's not, they wouldn't rule it out, and think more about the kind of expanding from a central point, radiating, as they say, radiating Chinese anti-access area denial capabilities outward, but into the two oceans, as they call it, in the direction of the two oceans, out to the Indian Ocean, into the, into the Arabian Sea, into the Persian Gulf, Western Indian Ocean even, uh, as well as out into the Pacific, to basically keep the United States at risk out to the second island chain, you're talking about more of them. That's sort of the vision. You don't, they don't want to fight, they don't want to be fighting inside the first island chain, they want to fight in between the first and the second island chain or even further out, and the way that they want to accomplish that is with an anti-Navy. Uh, I got the young yes, fellow the there. Oh, sure. One of the one, another good thing yeah. with the Chinese uh, presenting in Djibouti is that they uh, stop the piercing in the industry. Right. So that's that's the, the original country. that's the original reason for being. I think uh, perhaps others in here know better than I do, but I think the incidence of piracy is way down there since since that mission started. I think that was more of a convenient opportunity to practice. And that's understandable. They spend a lot of time trying to trying to uh, figure out how to do logistics if you want to operate out of area. They escorted a lot of ships. I know that they, they, they've got a. If you go to any of the PLA Navy briefings, which they used to uh, give to us through their defense attaches, we'll talk about how many ships and how many different escort missions. And I think uh, you know. I guess they defended some 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 merchant vessels. But ultimately, I think that's sort of a that's peripheral. It's a way for the Navy to, to get its sea legs, as it were, to be out uh, to be out in another region of the world and to figure out how to, how to operate. Got this fellow here. Yeah, thank, first, thanks for the comment on young fellow, you think you said. It was a really interesting talk and really nuanced, and I really appreciate it. Uh, I have a question about, you used the expression killing uh, the chicken to scare the monkey in the case of Australia, where sure. there are tensions there. And I'm wondering if it's more about learning how to kill a chicken. Because at the end of the day, 
to project power, to deter, you need to show that you know what you're doing. And China doesn't have any naval warfare experience at all, while the US is gaining more experience with all of the piracy and war movies, etc., and all of its past. China does not have any experience, and, and naval warfare is like a chess game. It's, it's a very complicated, almost mathematical kind of game to wage. And I'm wondering if China at some point realizes it needs practice. And if so, where does it get this kind of practice? Beating up on its neighbors. In, uh, that's, that's an interesting yeah. point, yeah. If you don't know how to kill chickens well, it's hard to kill chickens demonstrably. It's a way to scare bigger, bigger uh, potential opponents. And I, you know, I, I somewhat doubt that China expects to come to, you know, to be involved in naval con conflict with Australia. Although I'm sure they, they are thinking, they're thinking more seriously about it as Australia thinks about developing, you know, nuclear uh, attack submarines. I think is, is something that that has that kind of offense defense in mind. But ultimately, it is, it is an important thing to recognize that. Uh, as many do restraining the PLA or the PLA Navy, they've had no combat experience. Nobody in the force now, except for some of the very senior people, had any combat experience whatsoever. And in those cases, it's basically a, a not joint campaigns at a very small scale. There's an invasion uh, of Vietnam in 1979, essentially an army operation, not very successful. Not a good demonstration of you know PLA combat capability. I don't think they, I don't think that that gives the organization a ton of confidence that they would be able to do a large scale joint operation. Naval uh, experience, uh, even more limited, maybe a little more recent. Little skirmishes in the South China Sea. They, they've killed a couple of Vietnamese sailors to the seas islands uh, as recently as 1988. Not so not so recent, I suppose. Um, and I guess the, the flip side of that is that the U.S. Navy, despite being in good practice all the time, and despite certainly being able to do some of the very kind of complex uh, operational uh, tasks that China doesn't have experience with, say carrier aviation, or say uh, you know global submarine, uh, both you know ballistic missile uh, as well as hunter killer kind of the whole the whole cat and mouse game of submarines that we've been doing with the Soviets for all this time. China doesn't have that experience and those are those are those are capabilities that they want to practice and exercise and I guess in theory might want to engage in at a at, at a regional level in a way that wouldn't engage the United States. But as Chinese strategists also point out, the US hasn't fought a major naval campaign since World War II. There's nobody who's still in the force who had that specific experience, and it's possible that the lessons that the U.S. learned about, you know, carrier radiation or the, the use of submarines to interdict shipping or whatever it is, it's possible that those are the wrong lessons and that the U.S. is prepared to fight the last war and that China is now developing a new, you know, what they say, informationized uh, approach to warfare that heavily relies on cyber and space, and maybe less, less of the you know that they're not gearing up for a battle of midway the way that the United States Navy is. And so I don't know. I, 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 I once you start walking down this path of the, the uh, fight between the U.S. and China, I think it becomes very hard to hold anything constant because all the other circumstances surrounding that are totally unknowable and. It's a little bit hard to imagine that conflict without a very rapid escalation and it almost not mattering what the naval capabilities are if you all of a sudden have intercontinental ballistic missiles up in the air. But um, I do worry about China wanting to kill chickens for the sake of killing chickens. I worry less about Australia because it's a very close U.S. ally and I think they're not, I, I think the U.S commitment to be involved in a fight with Australia is probably very credible to China. I worry about Vietnam. Uh, as I mentioned, that is the that is the one local actor that they've showed a willingness to, to use lethal force and, and have come much closer to conflict even very recently in a lot of these skirmishes in the South China Sea, sinking boats 
kidnapping fishermen, you know, irregular, low intensity type things, but that have escalatory potential. I think those are the sorts of engagements that the PLN Navy looks at and they say, well, you know, the Vietnamese operate some, some, uh, some nice Soviet submarines. They have, uh, you know, uh, at least a, a uh, sort of a, a capability that would test the Chinese Navy's ability to do a, a, an amphibious landing and seizure of an island that might signal something about Taiwan, for example. And I worry about I worry about that case especially China, Vietnam, more so than Australia. Uh, another discussion, but a good a good question. And I think we may. We may be short on time, but I'll, I'll let you, you tell me. I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah, you tell me when. Especially from the student, they will be cool. Yes, please. If we have any other student questions, I, I would be more than happy to answer it. Uh, so, sure. taking the Haifa port into account, sure. Uh, is there a pattern for of a we, preference? We uh, is there a pattern for or a preference of the Chinese to build ports right next to existing local ports? And if so, how is the competition going economically? Sure. Do they outcompete them? Do they, I don't know, uh, state, uh, I mean, they are state-owned enterprises, and more than 80% of them. So do they get uh, incredible benefits from the state in order to outcompete? So um, it's very difficult to see the financing for Shanghai International Port Group, which has invested a lot in this. Bayport, they, as you can see, there's brand new, brand new equipment there. Very, very, very nice, big, modern cranes, etc. That stuff's all very expensive. Um, presumably, they have some advantages in in in, uh, in capital markets in the sense that there's a certain because of interest in developing maritime power, there's a certain amount of credit in the Chinese system that's allocated at low rates to support these sorts of goals. I think. They're probably not that much more competitive in that way than, say, Dubai Ports World, which may end up being a partner here in um, in, in Haifa for the for the old port. Uh, but there's they're basically their scale advantages and then their institutional advantages that they get by virtue of being a state on the firm. On your other question about where they like to go, okay, so, so there's two parts of that. So one, it is very common for them to expand an existing port like we have here in Haifa or to take a lease in an expanded part of the port as they've done here and have done in uh, Sri Lanka, for example, um, where it's in competition with another terminal that's run by another party. And I, I, from what I understand, having had a discussion with, the, with all the, the Israeli shipping and ports people in, in government and in industry, that's part of the vision here, in a sense, is to uh, you know, push push the, the, the other terminals to be more competitive, ideally not drive them out of business, but you know, break, break the union, you know, cause, shake up the industry, start, start something else. And so some part, of, some part of that is, that's kind of Israel's idea, and China's just the, the instrument of it. But if you look at the way the ports have developed in China, I think you sort of see this pattern of, they'll build a, a huge, you know, mega container uh, terminal and even a whole port complex just a couple miles down the road from another one uh, for reasons that have to do with, in some cases, cheap land, cheap financing. The, the model in China, I think, is quite different than it is elsewhere, but they do have a habit of, of developing over capacity uh, domestically. And that's actually, you know, I was sort of being teasing about not knowing what the Belt and Road is. I still don't actually know what it is, but one thing that it definitely reflects, or some part of it, is this domestic overcapacity. The fact that all these port firms have, have a lot of uh, capital, among other things, but also uh, skilled labor, materials in China, including concrete, steel, et cetera, et cetera, uh, as well as uh, you know, a, a, a demand for foreign markets and warehousing space and, and just just throughput in general that they're exporting. This is kind of part of it. And so they're almost it's almost a guarantee that any country or port authority that tenders bids to develop a container terminal or even a, you know, a bulk port, you're almost certainly gonna have a big Chinese firm 
Often it's a local or a provincial state-owned enterprise. Firms from Dalian, firms from Shenzhen, firms from Shanghai, like you have here, et cetera, where they basically, they need to grow, they need to internationalize because they have unutilized, as they are unutilized capital and potentially labor, and they need to grow because that's their, that's, uh, I guess, is sort of the, the, the model of capitalism, even, even for Chinese socialism, it's like uh, sharks needing to swim, right? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not an economist, I don't know exactly why it, that is, but it seems to be that the inexorable logic of these firms is as they, as they, they need to achieve greater scale in order to maintain their, their profitability and their edge. So I think we're likely to continue seeing that. I think we see even here in the Eastern Mediterranean, there is a lot of redundancy. Uh, I was speaking to Shanghai International Port Group's general manager just yesterday, actually, and I was curious how he thought about the port at Piraeus, which is not so far away. Uh, it obviously is thinking about a different gateway market, but if you're thinking about Eastern Med as a market, potentially serving the same same uh, same uh, area, and the fact that it's uh, essentially it, it, it's majority owned and controlled by Costco, which is both a competitor as well as a shareholder in SIPG and where, where he sees that going. And I think, you know, he's not really in a position to, to say that he feels uh, feels anything other than a healthy sense of competition with his, with his national uh, partner. But I think ultimately what you see is China with its scale advantages, especially Costco, making some of these markets uncompetitive for other firms because they're just doing it cheaper and they're flooding and you know they're increasing capacity to a point where it's not profitable for other firms to be in it. I think this is a you know within a domestic system like the US, I don't know what antitrust is like in, in Israel, these are the sorts of things that might get regulated by the state because it, it creates non-competitive dynamics. You don't want that overwhelming scale that creates not you know and market share that makes it impossible for other market entrants. I don't know that China's achieved that in the Eastern Med, but if they were to build up and scale up capacity, I believe actually the, the Shanghai International Port Group guys told me they thought they could bring this from 1.8 million TEUs, which is its design capacity once those other terminals uh, open, up to three or four million. They view that as being the sort of high end of capacity. I, I don't know, I'm not in the shipping business, but I, I will say, um, if you have a lot of capacity like that, it creates that type of dynamic. So yeah, I think it's tough for, it's gonna to be tough for Israeli firms to compete. Uh, I think it may not be an Israeli firm that ends up coming in. Who do you know we're talking about? Maybe Dubai Ports World being the, the, uh, another actor here. They're another firm, they're one of a small number of firms that have that type of scale and can, I think, compete with the Costco or Shanghai International. I'll be interested to see how that plays out, and I'll probably, I'll probably come back and visit. Thank Thank you. I have one, two, uh, two questions. One small, you said before, you said at the beginning, that China import coal from Australia. Why? Because China is one of the biggest uh, coal producers in the world. Well, and they, they also import rice. Okay, they, they import everything uh, that they can uh, get their hands on. They, they also export coal, but they're net, they're all, I think they're a net coal exporter, but they still import a lot and because they the export main question it. Is, you know, in all of these stories, there's one a big body in between, India. Right. And, you know, it looks like the tide is going around India and when, how far it's going to go until India will decide to react. And it's happened already, like one or two years ago in the Andaman Islands. There was right. a small incident. That's right. Well, I think. I think India is really, India is really the swing player in in the region in a really meaningful way. And I just want to mention, I'm actually Indian expert, not in China. Well, I, I'm I'm glad, and I I uh, I should I should learn as much as I can about India, frankly. And I I learn about everything sort of through this weird uh, uh, prism of what the Chinese write and say about it. So I'm learning about India from a Chinese perspective. And I think they have a, they have a couple different views about India, uh, but 
um, you know, in the way that they consider the South China Sea to be a sort of a, a zone of Chinese uh, military and political kind of predominance, they, they don't feel that way about the Indian Ocean, uh, and they think of India as a second as a second-rate player, and they'd like to keep it that way, and that's one of the reasons that they are so invested in their relationship with Pakistan. Um, as you probably know, that's that's India's principal security concern. Even though I think China is starting to starting to jockey, at least at the sort of elite level, with you know their strategic attention. But, um, and I think ultimately, there used to be a lot of confidence among Chinese scholars, at least, that India's permanently non-aligned, that that's sort of their, that is their strategic orientation, and it's, it's sort of given by God in a way, and there's nothing that the, you know, that they, that they, they have contempt for the Americans, that's rivaled only by their contempt for the British, and that they have a, you know, like China, have a, have a rich and deep sort of civilizational mentality that makes them unlikely to be part of any sort of block. Uh, never mind that they, uh, associate very closely with the Russians. They're okay with that. They just want them to stay not aligned. And <clears throat> China and India, when they are getting along better, often get together and talk about multipolarity. And they want to think about each of themselves as, as uh, you know, kind of autonomous and independent in their own way. But ultimately, and, and I do think that you know, we, we did a big study on Guadar, for example, if you're interested in that port. It's a 25,000 word piece. You can go to the China Maritime Studies Institute and, and if you really are uh, a glutton for punishment, you can find out all about every single thing that they've done about uh, at Guadar. But I think one of the reasons that we haven't seen Guadar become a more militarized facility, we haven't seen a much more overt kind of uh, PLA presence in Pakistan, even as they have very acute security threats and attacks on Chinese assets and personnel there, is that ultimately China is wary of changing it, India's alignment fundamentally. And they think of Pakistan as something that they want, they want to hit India with Pakistan. They don't want to be in Pakistan hitting India themselves, is sort of their view. They want, they want to maintain that plausible deniability because I think the moment that India determines that China is essentially, um, you know, is one and the same with its existential enemy, I think it becomes much easier for India to say, you know, we need to think about the Quad as something more than just, uh, you know, uh, a, a nebulous conceptual thing, the Quad being the US, India, Australia, Japan, League of Maritime Democracies, who China thinks of as a containing coalition. China has felt very confident in the past. They feel like India would never, could never be involved in an alliance, and ultimately is not going to be, you know, balancing against China because it has its own interests. At some point, you know, and, and you know, fighting, killing Indian soldiers in the Himalayas runs contrary in, in some ways to this view. But in other ways, maybe it doesn't. It's it's figuring out where you know how how far can we push this and find out where what, what's a breaking point for India that they will not accept subordination to China and will really look outside for support. And maybe they got there, and maybe they'll make a determination that well, India is already permanently against us, and we might as well start a formal alliance with Pakistan and have a permanent military base there. I don't think they're there yet. I don't think they want to be there. I don't think that's. I don't think that would be wise. Um, but you know, ultimately, India will have at least locally quite a lot of power projection capability. Uh, even if China has a base in Djibouti, and even if it has you know logistical capabilities that it can knit together across the Indian Ocean, it's still going to have a big problem with Indian missiles and air power out of India anytime it wants to operate in the Indian Ocean. And I think that's going to be the case for a long time, whether or not India is very closely aligned with the US or not. So I think, you know, it's in China's interest, and I imagine they're 
they prefer to keep it this way that India stays on sides and isn't pushed isn't pushed into a counter coalition. But uh, stranger things have happened. States have made mistakes. I would argue strategically it's probably unwise for China to turn India into a permanent enemy. But you, you know better than I what the nature of the discussion is in India now. It seems like China, uh, at least from what I read, the story has changed really dramatically in India, and they really do um, have, have a serious discussion going about aligning against China. So uh, it's an, an inch, a very interesting dynamic to watch, certainly. Uh, uh, okay. I want to make sure that we don't have any other students, otherwise I'll turn it to the or we have to thank very much, Andy, for the department, the guys over here, so it's the opportunity to, to know our center and you're welcome here any, any time. I'm doing my PhD in the department, so I can be the focal point for this, so feel free to contact me. And thank you again, Isaac. My pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm, I'm planning another trip. 